So as I mentioned, we'll be talking about. Did you want a sheet there, buddy? Oh, you don't. Okay. We'll be talking about um, discipleship. Um, oh, here. Um, we'll be talking about discipleship, which leads us to a very obvious question: What is discipleship to you? You're staring. Being a servant of the Lord. Okay. Why does it mean that to you? That it's yeah, you know, those underneath like an elder or. Okay. All right. How about you guys? What does this habit mean to you guys? Training someone how to, I guess, live. Okay. Like, could you elaborate a little more? Um, like, okay, so a new Christian, mm -hmm. take them aside and spend some time with them and show them how to study the Bible, how to witness, how to um, pray, how to um, show God's love, you know. So you're saying this is something above and beyond simply being saved? Yes. Hmm. And why do you think that? Um, I think people are more likely to stay a Christian if they get discipled than if they don't. Hmm. Because they have guidance and where they need to go instead of just dropped out in the middle of nowhere. Hmm. Okay, what do you guys think? What does discipleship to you guys? With, yeah. with Gracie, Gracie. I think it is <clears throat> helping baby Christians, if you will, um, teaching them the ways and helping them, guiding them. Okay. Along. So is there a point when someone is discipled? Um, I think there comes a point where someone can start discipling themselves. Okay. They take what they're, the, the knowledge they receive and then help someone else with it. Okay. What were you, what were you going to say? I saw you kind of <laughs> thinking about it. Um, no, I, I mean, I, I, I agree also with what Gracie said. Um, I think it's teaching people how to create lasting relationships. Okay. Starting with Jesus. Because once we can develop a lasting relationship with Jesus, we can help other people. We have the effective tools to help other people to create lasting relationships with Jesus and also with other people. Hmm. Because I think having healthy relationships is probably the most important, one of the most important things about being a Christian, because we have to always, we have to always be an example. Everybody is watching us, you know, and especially if now we're saying we're a Christian, then we need to, not that we're, not that we're perfect and we're not going to make mistakes, and I think that people need to see Christians make mistakes also. But I think people need to see how we do <coughs> those mistakes differently than the world does. Mm, okay. So I think it's I think it's a part of number one, teaching people how to develop a lasting relationship with Jesus and how to develop a healthy and lasting relationships with the people around them. Okay. Does anybody else have anything to say? Anything to add? I think also we're supposed to go and make disciples. Then Jesus tell his disciples to go out and make disciples. Okay. So I think it's one of the things as a Christian we should be doing. Not just something we could do, but it's vital that we do. So it is it possible then to separate discipleship from being a Christian? No. No? 
Um, what do you think? Um, I don't really think you can. Huh. I think we're always learning, and we should always be teaching what we're learning. Huh. It's a 24-hour job. It's it's something that we are never. Uh, now I gotta do two things. Just kidding. right. It's something <laughs> that we're never apart from. We should always be learning and growing mm -hmm. in our relationship with God, and we should always be teaching other people what we're learning hmm. to help them grow. Hmm. So I I don't think that I don't think you can separate that. Hmm. Anything else? So a real basic uh, definition, which I think you guys were hitting right around anyway, so I mean this is basically summarizing what everybody already said, living like Christ. I mean that's pretty, pretty simple. I mean does, did I miss, did I miss did, am I missing anything in that definition? No? Okay. Does anybody else need something to write on? Yeah, does anybody else need anything to write on? <laughs> you want to take this turn? Or that's fine too if you want to just grab that. Okay. In the past, um, the church had an interesting way of, of being discipled. See, what happened was the church became imperialized. What that means is that whereas before Christians were persecuted by the government, all of a sudden they were accepted, and that was kind of like the, it was it was kind of like the end thing to be Christian all of a sudden. And Christians were like, whoa, this is totally different than anything we've ever known. We've always been persecuted. Now it's like we're the in crowd. And so what a lot of people did is they said, you know, this isn't good for Christianity. This is this is making us weaker Christians. This is making us um, not true to Christ. And so they resolved this tension by creating monasteries, monastic, monastic communities, what you know as monks. They separated themselves to make themselves more dedicated than the average Joe because those people were just sinful hooligans and they wanted to be they wanted to be in step with God. Okay, so uh, monastic communities were used for discipleship. What pros and cons do you think would exist with using um, the the monk way of discipleship? Well, a con would be well, you're not with you're not with others, other people. So yeah. how are you going to Get other people to know of Jesus. Right. Okay. Okay. But aren't they? Hmm. hmm. Anybody else has something to say to this? I mean, I, I agree with Gracie. That's the first mm -hmm. thing I thought was that yeah. they don't really There's no they really there. interact with other people except for each other. So yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess you can disciple the new monks that come in. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> but it seems to me like. They've they're, kind of already made that decision. They're already they're there. isolating. They have yeah, isolated the, themselves. Okay, so so far the, the a big con being that they're kind of separated from the world. What what other pros and cons do you guys see? Pros probably be more in touch, um, in meditating. Oh, okay, so like less distractions. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. There's a good. There's a pro. Okay, I mean, how many of you guys would like to just leave away all the craziness and go somewhere quiet for once? <laughs> that would be nice, right? But anyway, I'm sorry, I'm getting off track. That you guys. That would be nice, but that doesn't have anything to do with discipleship. No. You know what I mean? Being alone, I can't disciple anybody <laughs> if I'm just by myself. Yeah, it gives me more time with God, but that I'm still not with people, mm. which is who I'm supposed and to be discipling. Ain't nobody yeah. as human beings. We need to be around other people. I gotcha. Nicole, what were you going to say? I was going to say that. Oh. I was thinking something and it just kind of... Oh, okay. All right. All right. So we've got one big con being that you're kind of blocked off from the world. And then one big pro being that that allows you the clarity to just be alone and, 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 and focus on, on God and the scriptures and whatnot. Okay. So are there any other big pros or cons that you guys are seeing? No? Okay. Um, I think that you guys really are, are right on topic with that. Um, I mean, there is a certain area of discipleship where, where you know, 
kind of allow yourself the the calm to focus on Christ, but that doesn't mean that it has to be 24/7 <coughs> of calm all by yourself, away from the world. You know what I mean? I think Paul kind of talked about this when he said, you know, I didn't mean for you to go separate yourself from from the world, because because then you'd have to be out of the world. And I think that with monastic communities, they kind of tried to go out of the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that also partly it has um, a little bit to do with kind of this idea of uh, self-righteousness or pride. You know what I mean? That you didn't want to be with all the other hooligans. That wasn't good enough. You wanted to be the elite of Christianese. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, kind of like, here are the monks are. Here's the rest of Christians. And here's just the sinful world. Well, yeah. I mean, that just... You know, the people tried to do that with the whole uh, Holy Spirit thing, where, you know, there's being saved, but then there's the elite people who are who are filled with the Holy Spirit, and they're just a step ahead of all the other Christians. Well, <laughs> see what I mean? Kind of doing the exact same thing. So, um, discipleship is more than just drawing close to God. Discipleship is more than just seeking after God. There's another element in there that, that, is, that is of necessity connected. Um, and that's serving others. If there's no outpour, there can be no discipleship. Because discipleship is not being filled alone. It's being filled and being poured out. So, um, limited withdrawal can be of benefit, though. Um, for instance, maybe taking a week you know, off, going up to the mountains and, and whatever. Uh, taking a vacation from work and just spending that. You know, I've seen people do that. Um, I actually, there was um, a pastor who was... Um, got involved with some stuff and, and, and he ended up messing up and um, what he did is um, he took I think it was two years off and he just spent those years regrounding his faith in God because what ha what had happened is it just became all about the things all about the doing things he was a pastor so it was all about you know the routine this is how we do things and, and he'd gotten so disconnected from his relationship with God that there really wasn't a base anymore, you know what I mean? And so it, it, at the end of these, at, at the end of this two years, he went back to his church, and he started serving again, but not as a senior pastor. He served under people, and then they raised him up. And then when they felt, when 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 that leadership felt it was time, he took back over as a senior pastor. So I mean, they were able to resolve the issue, but he had lost that re he lost grasp with that with that. That core of, of why he was doing the thing he was doing, you know, and I think that it's the same kind of thing here. Anyways, um, does discipleship have to make people missionaries? Okay, why do you guys say no? In a way, I mean, like. Well, hold on, hold on. before you start answering, do we have any yeses? Yes. Okay, now hold on. And do we? And we have noes. And you have a maybe. It's in my answer. Okay, all right, all right. So let's start with the no's. Who, who is a no? You? Not really? We'll come back to you? Yeah. Okay, let's start with the yeses then. Serena? Well, because that's what discipleship is. It's going out and it's teaching people about, you know, Jesus and how to live like Jesus. You know, you're, you're getting people to accept Christ, but we don't want to just leave people there. You mm -hmm. know, we want... Like I said, it's about creating relationships and building up other people to have lasting relationships, well, lasting relationships with God and other people. Okay. So we're not just teaching people to serve God, but to serve others as well. You know, we want to make them also yeah. fruitful in their communities and pointing up at. and pointing out, right? So I think that missionary, I, I, I think it's okay. I, yeah, I think you discipleship. Interconnected. Okay. Gracie, what were you going to say? Um, pretty much what um, Serena is saying to add on to it, though, I think, I think we're, once we become Christian, you kind of are a missionary, whether it's at work, in your town, on your street. You're, you're a missionary. You don't have to go overseas to be a missionary or get titled. So in a way, yes, but also in a way, no. Not necessarily quote-unquote missionary, but... Leaning toward yes, because... To me, missionaries are people that are, you know, going out and getting more people saved. And in a way, I mean, we're all kind of missionaries in a way. Okay. Uh, Zach, did that kind of yeah. where you're standing? Yeah. Was there anything you wanted to add to what they said? Uh, okay. Nicole, Chuck, did you guys have anything you wanted to say? No? No. Um, I think... Um, 
that when I flip to the side here, it, it's going to say no, but it's actually kind of because it's agreeing with what you guys are saying. So let me just kind of clarify that. No, because um, not everybody is called to quit their job and go into like another country as, as a missionary, you know what I mean? But yet, at the same time, yes, because we are all missionaries technically. See what I mean? So it, it says no on the thing, but it's basically the exact same thing you guys were saying. Um, as, as my point of reference, I was using um, Acts, and, and Acts, I'll just read it. Why, why allude to something? Why not just read it? Okay, Acts chapter 2, verse 1 says, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Now, um, the Holy Spirit comes down on them, and they start speaking different tongues, and then Peter gives a sermon to the people who, who overhear outside, and he closes up uh, around the end of his sermon saying, uh, saying this, um, For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Uh, and then verse 40, and with many other words he bore witness, witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourself from this crooked generation. But then in verse 41, there's something very important that happens. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Now, Peter ends up in Rome about sometime in like the late 50s or early 60s somewhere. But this story takes place in the, in the 30s. And it seems like the Church of Rome was already started by about the mid to late 30s. So that brings up the question, well, if Peter, who supposedly founded the Church of Rome, uh, the Church in Rome, wasn't even in Rome, historically speaking, he could have been, but we don't have evidence of him being there until the late 50s, early 60s. So if he wasn't even there, how did it get going? And the answer is, is well, most historians believe that it was these people who got saved at the, at the day of Pentecost, day of Pentecost, who then went back to their homelands, and peop these people were not missionaries, quote unquote. They were, um, you know, traders, uh, pe people who sold stuff and, and that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? So the gospel was spread in a large way along the the trade routes by people who weren't even quote unquote missionaries. And then Paul comes. And he is actually a missionary just with the focus of going to these different places. So, I mean, I think that's kind of important to note that most of the evangelism, um, missionary work that was being done wasn't even by a missionary. It was by Christians who were living their day-to-day -day life but doing so for the glory of God. So I think that kind of goes right in hand with what you guys were saying. They were missionaries. They weren't just not doing it like Paul was doing it. So... Um, yeah. What if God calls you somewhere you don't like? Too bad. <laughs> <Sorry>. Jeez. <laughs> That's harsh. That's <laughs> uh, not the No good for you. Why <laughs> tell God you don't like the Bahamas? Lord, I'll never go to the Caribbean. <laughs> never send me to the Caribbean. I'll never go. Hawaii. That's terrible. It's ugly. I would get tired of all the coconuts and putting the lime on the coconuts. And, <laughs> and the beautiful crystal clear waters with the water bowl. I mean the terrible, terrible waters. Yeah, sorry. Terrible, terrible waters. They have nothing to eat but fresh things all day. Oh my gosh, it's terrible. <laughs> okay, no, but seriously. Obviously, it's important to be obedient no matter the circumstance. You know, and that's when we have to realize it's not about us. You know, it's about the work that God has called us to do. And, you know, if we're obedient and we're faithful, God is going to bless us. And, you know, the chances of you being somewhere that you don't like, you're not, you're, you're sure you're not going to be there forever. 
<laughs> oh, wouldn't that suck? You know, unless God <laughs> tells you, this is where I want you, and you are going to die Lord here, so get used to it, you know, but... <laughs> <laughs> but, I, I don't know. I, I think that it's just important to remember that, it, you know, we need to be obedient, and we have to think of, of we, not ourselves, but the impact that, that we're going to make where we're at, and that other people's salvation and lives are more important than our comfort and whether we like something or not. Have you guys ever had this fear before, though? God sending you to this place that you hate? Not People? yet. You've not had this yet. fear? You want to share? I'm always scared that I'm going to be put somewhere where there's like a lot of tornadoes or a lot of flooding or a lot of earthquakes. Or... Yeah. Well, even here, I was raised in Albuquerque, Edgewood area, yeah. and I missed it for a long, you know, time. I mean, we haven't lived here that long, but it was a couple of years that I really, really wanted to go back <laughs> home, you know, but, you know, I just see, like, what God has done in my life, you know, alone here, and it's, it's important to be obedient. It really is. Yeah. Zach, what were you going to say? I never thought that I would be here in New Mexico. I was born and raised in California. Yeah. So A lot bad. different than California. Yeah, very. <laughs> and I came here when I was 15, and I was like, yeah. I want to go back. <laughs> I want to go back. I messed everything up. But it was due to my stepdad. Uh, yeah. here. You know, this is something that can. Were you? Did I cut you off? Okay. Uh, this is something that's going to come up again and again and again in your life. Is wanting to go back to a certain time in your life. That's just something that's going to always resurface. And the thing is, you can never go back because things will always change. Um. You know, like for instance. There, there will be a time, I guarantee you, when, when, when Pastor Randy is no longer the pastor, and there will be some people who, who are still out on their pursuit looking for the church just like Pastor Randy had. You know I mean, they'll be looking for that same kind of pastor. They'll be looking for that same kind of thing. They'll be looking for that same church. But the truth is they're never going to find it because everything is always changing. The church is going to change. The new pastor, whoever he is after Pastor Randy, is going to be different than him. He's going to do things differently. And that's a good thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying the world is always changing. You know, if, if I were to go back to, to where my home was in Southern California, I can guarantee you it wouldn't look anything like I remember, and it wouldn't be nearly as fun as I remember. First off, well, let's not get into it. Never mind. I'm just going <laughs> to move on past that. But the, and my point being, this is going to be something that you're going to struggle with for the rest of your life. I can guarantee it. Ecclesiastes put, puts it like this. Um, crap, dang it. Oh, I had it in my head just a second ago. Um... Okay, so I'm going to paraphrase because I don't remember how Ecclesiastes says it. But he talks about the way that, you know, it's not a, it's not a smart thing to look back on, on, on the golden days. You know what I mean? Yeah. And my pastor actually had a sermon about this. And, and you know, that's always, that's always the temptation. You don't have to just be old to have that temptation. Everybody has that temptation, yeah. you know. Oh, I remember the good old days. But, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the times are always changing, you know what I mean? They really weren't that good. <laughs> a lot of times they really weren't that great. <laughs> And I know some people who are constantly trying to go backwards. Instead of forwards. Yeah, instead of just allowing change yeah. to. I mean, here's a perfect example of the difficulty of moving on. As parents, Nicole and Chuck, I, I hope you can just pretend to know what we're talking about here, but your children start growing up and they start having more and more independence and then they start doing more and more things their own way and it's just. You have to learn to adapt to go from them as a baby to a toddler to a preteen to a teenager. Yeah. And I don't even know what I'm going to do when Eli turns into an adult. <laughs> oh, my gosh. But anyways, you get what I'm saying. The way that you have to change the way that you're doing things, and you, you have to understand that they're changing in the way that – you know what I mean? Because it's always changing. It's always moving forward. So uh, I know a lot of people who really go to go to shreds about stuff, but it's it, it's – really important that you remember 
a big part of discipleship is being able to adapt yourself to the new time and, and moving forward. Um, a, a lot of times people want to hold on and still be a disciple of God, and it just it, it doesn't work like that. You know, I think Jesus gave a lot of examples of this. One being, you know, the guy, oh, let me just bury my dad. Let the let the dead bury their dead, and you follow. See what I mean? Or the guy who, who wanted to follow after Jesus, and he said, well, okay, foxes have holes. The Son of Man doesn't even have a place to lay his head. Like, you see what I mean? The, the way that he just – the Sabbath ship, according to Jesus, was just so far out of the norm and out of what you're so used to and out of, so what's, of what's so comfortable. So uh, anyways, um, uh, Serena mentioned this. Life is more than pleasure. Our lives as Christians, we have to understand <laughs> that we have a very limited time on earth, and – we're not and we're not going to reach the end of our life and say, boy, I wish I would have done just one more thing that I that I wanted to do. See what I mean? We're going to reach heaven and say, boy, I wish I would have done one less thing that I wanted to do. See what I mean? Yeah. It's going to be the exact opposite of how you'd think. Um, God's blessing and guidance is sweeter than missing God's direction. It, it's I, I heard one one pastor say it like this. I used to be afraid God would send me someplace I didn't want to go. Now I'm afraid that that God won't be with me when He sends me somewhere. Yeah. See what I mean? Yeah. I'm more cons he said, I'm, I'm more concerned now that I'll be outside of God's will than that I'll be somewhere I don't like. See what I mean? And I really appreciated his, his honesty and his perspective because that's something we all kind of have a hard time with. Um, <coughs> what it comes down to, though, is seek God and don't worry about the rest. It's Life is a journey, and you don't know where the next turn is going to pull off at. You just know where you're at now. You know what I mean? So just try to enjoy the journey for what it is, and this will allow you to refocus your attention rather than on hypotheticals or, or, or nostalgia, hypotheticals being what could be in the future and nostalgia being what was so perfect in the past, to instead saying, okay, this is where I am in life, and I have to learn to enjoy it or my life's going to pass by, and I'm not going to enjoy any of it. See what I mean? It's a total waste. Um and this is something that everybody's going to struggle with in different times of their lives. Remember, we were talking about this er about this before. We were talking about th there you go through life crisis when you're at when you're at 25, when you get out when you go to high or college, you're on 18. You remember this, you guys? And I said when you get to in the 35, 40 region, you go through another little life crisis. You go through these these times of just oh my gosh, everything's changing. You know what I mean? And and, and so, anyways, Jonah chapter one. Did anybody have anything to say to that? Well, and then we're also humans, so we have some issues as humans in, in that area, you know, with the, the changes of life yeah. and oh my gosh. hormonal issues, you know. Like, <laughs> yeah. So not only is it just life changing, but there's actually physical things changing in our bodies throughout our whole yeah. life. Yeah. You know, kids go through puberty, adults oh, go okay. through a hormonal change too. Me and Michael yeah, were talking boss. about this. Adults go through a hormonal change yeah. too, and men go through these. Yeah. Oh no, we were, I was talking to Randy and Susan because oh. we were telling Eli that's a midlife crisis yeah. car. Yeah. <laughs> when, we were on when we were on vacation like, a couple uh, weeks ago, that's a midlife. Cr what's a midlife crisis car? I want a midlife crisis car. No, oh, you don't. Have a midlife no, crisis, and then you'll get one of those cars. <laughs> Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Now, when I was growing up, when, and I would ask this question, what if God sends me somewhere I I don't like they would always sugarcoat it god's not going to send you anywhere you don't like if you're truly if you're truly seeking after god you'll want to go you'll be fine with going wherever no 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 there are going to be times when god's going to call you some places and some places some people won't like some of the places that god calls them to and some people will for instance let's say god calls one person to live in uh greenland They're like oh my gosh i hate it here but then let's say God calls someone else to go there, and they're like, oh my gosh, I love it here. I mean, people are different. It's just the way it is. Um, and then another example of this is Jeremiah. You want to you wanna see someone who had a hard time with his calling, Jeremiah. 
Jeremiah did not have a good time. He didn't like that nobody listened to his message. He didn't like the place that he had to go. He didn't like having to stay there while his hometown got or home country got destroyed. He didn't he didn't like any of it. Not only that, but God specifically told him not to get married, so he couldn't even share with someone else. Uh, he couldn't enjoy the profits of the land because Jer uh, Jerusalem was was taken over and, and and everything was lost. And not only that, but, but the people ended up taking him against his will to Egypt, where he presumably died. Um, and uh, uh, the only place where he finally got to got to have something worth it, God told him, "Go buy this plot in Jerusalem." And he goes and buys it. And he's like, "This is this is that is a sign to them that they will they will be they will return from this exile and everything." But, anyways, um, Jeremiah was a person who really had a hard time. Jeremiah twenty verse nine: If I say I will not mention him or speak anymore in his name, I I I won't be a prophet anymore. I'll just go and live my life. There is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am very, and I am weary with holding in, and I cannot. See, he didn't enjoy the thing that he was doing. He didn't want to be a prophet, and uh, he didn't want to be a prophet at the time that he was a prophet, and in the place he was a prophet, and yet you see him having to do it anyways. So, um, to bust that myth, yes, sometimes God does call you to places you don't like, but God will be with you in those situations when he calls you to those places. Um, what three ethical themes are consistent challenges? If you had to say three things that every person is going to struggle with, no matter who they are, great or small, man or woman, what three things would it be? And I know this kind of sounds like it's out of nowhere. This is the basis we're going to build on this next month. We're going to build on it. Just three things that everybody struggles with. Everybody. Are you going to say one is pride? Yep, that's one. Yeah. It surfaces in different ways, yeah. but yeah, it's pride. <laughs> Anything else? Greed? Yes. Um, There's two, pride and greed. You guys are good. Oh my gosh, you guys are good. Only one left. Wow, you guys are good. <laughs> Shut my mouth. <laughs> What's the third? Pride, greed... An emotion. Well, it's like a. There, there's a couple different words that you can use, but they're all kind of tied together, so I'll accept any of them. Oh, jeez. And I'll kind of show you what I mean when I go to the point. Uh, See, now you guys are not going to be able to figure out the last one because these two are just. Ah, <laughs> Do you want me to go forward? Is it going to kill you guys? I think I may know it, but I'm. I was trying to get those next. Say it. Go ahead. Maybe Go ahead. envy. Maybe. Okay. Uh, I think that's kind of connected with with some of them, but it's not one of the ones I was looking for. Oh. But I think it, it goes in, in hand with it, though. I can't. I can't think of a. This is the best word that I can think of right now for it. I guess inadequacy. Okay. Like not really where I was going with it, but but I mean that's that that is true. Like we're not good enough. Or, like, we can't attain to what we're supposed to. Yeah. Um, I was more focusing on the ethical themes. But th that is good, though. That is good. Jack, what were you going to say? I was going to say jealousy. I guess it could be kind of connected. I'll just turn to it. Do what? Anger? I'll just turn to it. <laughs> um, pride, lust, lust, and greed. Uh... So the three ethical themes are money, sex, and power. Mm. But what those three things are the realms of business, marriage, and government. Marriage being very loose, more like relationship, I could say. So business, relationship, government. Um, if you want to break it down in a different way, um, success, relationships, and authority. If you want to break it down that way. Actually, that I think that that's good. Success. Um, Relationships and authority, but then the three the three bad the three evil sides of these things, greed, lust, and pride, mm -hmm. and every single person in the entire planet is gonna have to deal with these three ethical uh, uh, problems, challenges is how I have it written down there, and we're gonna build on this next month, so so you're gonna want to write that down, and we'll keep coming back to it. This is gonna be something that that. With the Sabbathship, if you're going to talk about the Sabbathship, these three things are eventually going to come up. So, um, I normally um, tell the youth from the POV song that's on Money, Power, and Fame. Yeah. <laughs>
Um, okay, so you ready for me to go to the next one? You guys got out of the hall? Yeah. Um, are these things evil? Yes. Yes. They can be. They can be. They can be. The bad sides of them, that's that's them when they're taken to the bad sides. But they themselves are not. Money, sex, and power. Those two things are not necessarily bad. See what I mean? I know it's a trick question. I, I got you guys on that one. <laughs> but Nicole was too quick. <laughs> so 1 Timothy 6, uh, 6.10. <laughs> Six ten. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. So he didn't say money was bad. Mm -hmm. uh, another misconception that goes with this is that Christians cannot be wealthy. No, there's no problem with being wealthy. The problem is is misuse of riches. That's what the Bible condemns. Misuse of riches. Um, it is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. There's a story in the Gospels with Jesus where this where this guy's like, what do I need to attain eternal life? And God, Jesus tells him, you know, hey, follow the commands. And he's like, I've done all that stuff. I'm perfect. You don't understand. I'm perfect. What am I lacking? And, and Jesus says, hmm, give away all your possessions. Give away all your money. Give it all away and follow me. And he says, ah. There was your problem, <laughs> because he was in love with it. See what I mean? It wasn't that he had the riches. Jesus doesn't command everybody to sell everything that they have and to give away all their money, does he? No. So those people who um, obviously are in love with it is holding on to them, and they're not able to move past. And you know, you don't have to be rich to be in love with wealth. So, anyways. Um, that takes us to Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 16. Yeah, I know, SOS, Song of Solomon. <laughs> I didn't want to write the whole thing out, guys. Forgive me. I didn't want to write it out. I was like, meh. It's after Proverbs, right? Yes. Okay. The hardest time remembering uh, where it is. Because nobody ever preaches out of it. No, they really don't. You know what? Just to screw with people, I think one day I'm going to have a whole sermon series on Song of Solomon. Yeah. All the little people will be like, what? You can't preach from that book. That's the book we do not speak of. <laughs> okay. Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 16. Awake, O north wind, and come, O south wind. Blow upon my garden. Let its spices flow. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its choicest fruits. Spoiler, he's not talking about an actual garden. <laughs> so, um, here we have Song of Solomon glorifying sex. So I don't think sex is the problem, is it? Rather, it's the lust of the flesh, huh? Yeah, yeah that's what I thought. Um, and we're going to actually talk, we're actually going to talk about a lot of different things. Um, we're going to talk about masturbation. We're going to talk about, you know, all these different things that, that in church is kind of like they don't talk about it. and So we never know. And so our discipleship is kind of halted, and our questions are never answered. <laughs> so if you want to jumpstart on this, this is the book that I'll be basing next month off of. It's called The Challenge of the Disciplined Life. It's by Foster, Richard Foster. We used it in college. It's a really good discipleship book. Um, and so if you want any more in-depth stuff on anything the stuff that we're talking about, it's in this book. And... We'll start on that next month, but right now we're just kind of laying. This month we'll just be laying the foundation. Next month we'll look at it. So, um, <clears throat> anyways, and then last up, Exodus seven one. And the Lord said to Moses, "See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet." So we see that power isn't a problem either. God gave Moses such power that he was considered to be the voice of God to Pharaoh. Yeah. That's kind of a big deal of authority there, isn't it? What higher authority is there than God? Yeah. See what I mean? And uh, so obviously I think that that kind of clarifies that these three things are not inherently evil. They are oftentimes used for evil. And the struggles that you face in life are going to be tied with one of these three things more than likely. More than likely. Um, yeah. So, okay.
No, they are not inherently evil, but are often used for evil. To live like Christ, what is required? Be trained every day. Yes, which involves... Love. Not what I was looking for. <laughs> what? Endurance. Yes, another word for endurance. Perseverance. Yes, and what's what's another word for perseverance? These are all right answers. I'm not saying she's not. I'm just I'm having her elaborate. I'm like, come on, somebody throw me a bone back here. Perseverance, endurance. Steadfastness. Well, yes, they're, they're all kind of the same idea. Discipline. <laughs> that that idea of that idea of sticking to it. And you know, when you're, whenever you're talking about discipleship, one of the key things about discipleship is discipline. Yeah. Because no person, no king goes to war before he first takes inventory of his army and the opponent's army. Jesus talked about this. You, you, you count the cost before you start the journey. Otherwise, you'll be put to shame and you'll have to retreat. <laughs> Jesus talks about this. Um, but anyways, it's that idea of discipline. You're in it for the long haul. You're not going to where you have to get that mentality of the trenches. We're in the trenches and we're in this. You know. Whenever you're talking about discipleship. Not saying you guys have to work at your current jobs for forever. <laughs> Nicole gives me the evil look. Like, wow. <laughs> okay. What are some signs of discipleship? Now there there is no wrong answer here. I'm just asking for some signs of discipleship. That you've been discipled. Of the process of discipleship. That you are being discipled. That you are discipling others. Whatever. Just go crazy. Well, for one, growth. Okay. Uh, what do you mean by growth? Um, it's kind of an ambiguous word to use. You see, you see a constant difference in someone. Okay. You can see them maturing. Okay, spiritual maturity. Okay, and I like I like that definition a lot more than growth. Because sometimes people will fail continually, continually on the same thing over and over again, but. Through that process of continual failure, they will become more spiritually mature. Yeah. So, I think that that needs to be differentiated from growth. Um, Anybody else going to say something? Do we have to continue? Yes, I'm trying to think of the words, though. Um, not the prettiest of words to say, but to the effect of more people becoming to Christ because of it. So, a greater influence? On other people? Is that what you're saying? Or yeah. I don't really get what you're saying. Okay, so you're discipling me. Okay. And then because you're discipling me, I started talking to Joe at work. Okay. And then Joe starts getting discipled by me. And Joe starts talking to Susan at work. Uh, hold on. You're a stay-at-home mom. Who's Joe? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Okay. So you see more people coming to Christ because of discipleship. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Were you going to say something? Well, I think that, you know, obviously we all struggle with selfishness, but I think seeing more selflessness in people, um, yeah. you know, more more willing to serve others and, and just the greater importance that, that people begin to hold to us, you know, yeah. start, you know, caring about other people and, and I think serving other people. Hmm. Okay. That's a good answer. So, so far, just to recap, we have um, uh, the process of, of reaching out to more and more people. And then we also have... Um, what was your first maturity. name? Spiritual maturity, yes. Sorry, spiritual maturity. But then also... Oh, we have uh, another brain fart. Uh, selflessness. Selflessness, yes. <laughs> I keep having brain farts. <laughs> Nicole? Love would probably be considered okay. in it. Showing people more patience and yeah. love. Yeah. I think... Just kind of opening up and being more... Yeah. I think Nicole's right on on that one because it's easy to love people when you're not involved with them. <laughs> <laughs> When you start doing ministry with them, you're like, oh my gosh, never mind. I don't even want you in heaven anymore. Just leave me alone. <laughs> you guys know what I mean. Don't pretend like you haven't been there. There's always that one person you're just like, oh. Under your skin. 
Yes, Hawk Smash! <laughs> oh my gosh. That one. That one. <laughs> For instance, people who, who think that, you know, Paul was wrong um, <laughs> with his tip of Barnabas. I mean, that's just stupid. Um, anybody else? <laughs> Or anything else. If you guys have answered before, you can answer again. Uh, anything else? Okay, keep thinking. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna start going ahead. But if you think I think of something, hop in. Um, so just from Second Timothy, uh, dedication to God, chapter two, verse fifteen. I'm sorry, 2 Timothy. Oof. Saying that just doesn't make much sense. What does women have anything to do with this <laughs> 2 Timothy 2, 15. <laughs> Watch, you know there's going to be some um, feminist or something that listens to this and be like, she's sexist. <laughs> I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm not. 2 Timothy 2, 15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. So I think this kind of goes right in hand with, with what Grace was talking about, spiritual maturity, that there's that certain dedication to God where you're not just like trying to float into heaven or some nonsense. You're actually like there's a commitment, there's a, um, a steadfastness, a, a, there's a, um, an effort. You know what I mean? There's that, that spiritual maturity that's taking place. Um, abstaining from immorality. Verse 22, so flee youthful uh, passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So here's a question. If the Holy Spirit is working these things in you, why does it say to pursue these things? Because the Holy Spirit is working in it, but we have to continually work to attain it. To, okay. To if we don't work at it, that's when we kind of fall off, I think. You know, okay. like, that's when we start becoming, you know, that's when the greater influence of outside things start coming in. Mm. If we don't actively pursue what yeah. God has put in us, we're going to, yeah. there's too much going negative yeah. going on around us. Yeah, and what, what Serena is saying here is she, she's not saying, she's not saying that it's all of a sudden us who are bringing this about in ourselves. She's not saying that. What she's saying, and correct me if I'm wrong here, is she's talking about that way that, that just because the Holy Spirit is doing a work in you doesn't mean that you kind of just trail off and do your own thing. You're still submitting to the Holy Spirit. You're still actively in, involved in seeking God and seeking these things that he has for you. See what I mean? So is that kind of what, No, yeah. that, that's exactly right. Were you going to say something? Um, it's, I mean, it's it's like the kid who um, goops off all the time and doesn't study for the test. Uh -huh. And when the test comes, he <laughs> prays, Lord. Please give me the answers for the test. You know, it's it's not gonna happen. No. No. You can pray for all the wisdom you want, but if you haven't studied for the test, no. you're not gonna know. Yeah. I think I think yeah. yeah. Anybody else have anything to add or anything else? Okay. Um, service to others and self sacrifice. Serena said this one. Uh, in chapter three, verse two, it says. Um, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy. Um, I'll keep reading. Heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. My goodness sakes. That was a and remember, this is not an exhaustive list. Yeah. Paul does this very frequently. He'll list things to kind of show you the attitude of someone. No. He does the same thing in 1 Timothy when he talks about picking a person to be an elder or a, a deacon. He does the exact same thing. He mentions when you're, when you're doing this, this is the kind of person. But it's not an exhaustive list. You can know that because if you compare Titus' list with 1 Timothy list, they're both different. So you're saying there's different qualifications for leaders? No. there's this, It's the idea of a person, the the... the, the the character of a person, you know what I mean. Um, so uh, there's certainly that it, it, for for someone to be a disciple, it would obviously go against these things that he's saying, mentioning as bad things. So the opposite of that would be ser uh, serving others in self-sacrifice, kind of death to self. The idea. Uh, then going down to chapter four, verse sixteen, uh, it says. Uh, 
At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. See what Paul was interested in? Not vengeance. Not not him being treated right. He was interested. He was interested in reconciliation. See what I mean? Discipleship is is giving up what you are owed. Discipleship is giving up what you deserve. Discipleship is is seeing other people for what they're worth, regardless of you know the situation. Um, pouring into other people because they are worth it, not because you know you're going to get something back. You know what I mean? That's discipleship. That's the core of discipleship. That's that's um, the idea of I'm not the master here. God's the master, and I'm just kind of doing what He told me to do, and that's just that's just how that goes. You know what I mean? It's the idea that you're not in competition with God. You're in submission to God. See what I mean? It's the idea of discipleship. Um, you know what I mean? You guys remember that last Sunday? Well, for those of you who weren't paying attention, evidently. So whenever I teach, Norval always says, you talk too fast, Michael. You need to slow down. So I make a conscious effort of every time that I'm every time that I'm preaching where there's going to be older people or teaching to stop and say these words. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you know what I'm talking about? So now Melvin, because <laughs> I said it about 20 billion times last Sunday night, so now Melvin, every time he says, and sees me, says, you know what I'm talking about, Michael? <laughs> but anyways, I thought it was funny, I guess. Uh, <laughs> purpose and direction. Chapter 3, verse 10 through 11. Uh, you, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life. My aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from all the Lord has rescued me. See what he's saying here? That that purpose in that direction, Disciple, discipleship meaning means having something, a goal in life, a purpose. And you can see that evident in Paul, what he's saying right here. He, he, in chapter 3, he starts off, you know, in the last days, difficult times will come. People will be lovers of self. And he goes down this long list. But then he says, you, however, have followed my teachings, my conduct, my aim in life. What was Paul's aim in life? God's kingdom. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Paul's purpose, his, his, his ever-waking thought, his, his, the thing that he was pursuing was, was, the, was the finish goal, was that end line. That's what he was running after. And... See, so that's what he's talking about, and so it's kind of like the subject is, is that. Anyways, um, solid beliefs, chapter 3, verse 14 through 17. But as for you, continue on what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All of Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for approof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. So we have this idea of solid beliefs. And I know we've focused a lot on solid beliefs over the past two or three years, three years, two years, whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, but uh, I'm trying to lean more towards this uh, purpose and direction. See what I mean? Uh, having, having intentional life. See what I mean? You don't have to have a perfect life. You have, as a Christian, you should have an intentional life. See what I mean? Live your life with purpose, with intention. See what I mean? Don't don't let your life just happen. Be intentional about it. You know, life, your life's going to change. Your job's going to change. God, you're going to, you know, for instance, Serena used to live, she was just talking about this. She used to live in Edgewood, Albuquerque area. Now all of a sudden her life took this big detour and she's off in the, in the dunes of southern New Mexico. See what I mean? Like, that's a big change. See what I mean? I mean, Albuquerque is the biggest city in, in New Mexico, and, and the nearest thing we got it barely has over 100,000 people. That's like one-fifth or one-sixth of Albuquerque. See what I mean? Like, that's a pretty big difference. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, um, that idea of, <sighs> of, of, of just the solidness there. Anyways, moving on. Whoops. It made it big. There we go. I didn't know I could do that. These kinds of things. So we'll look at more of these next week. Kind of review some of the things that we talked about this week. But but for now, I think that's that's where we're going to stop on this. 
Um, but just those kinds of things, that dedication, abstaining from immorality, self-sacrifice, purpose and direction, solid beliefs. You know who you believe in, you know why you believe in him, and you're doing what he called you to do. You know what I mean? Even though life's going to change, even though things are going to be uncertain, you're, you're not – yeah, you get what I'm saying. So if you had a follower who was to carry on your work in, in the spirit, the atmosphere of you, what would you expect of him? This is the question of the week. If you had a follower who was to carry on your work, the spirit of who you are, you're, they were going to – you wouldn't have a living testament. I mean a last testament. They would be your last testament. This person, what would you expect of them? Big question, right? Um, if you look on your sheet um, – Right after question of the week, there's one more thing. It says homework. What I would like for you guys to do, if you can at all make time to do this, please do. Read through 2 Timothy and list marks of discipleship that you find there. Things that make you a disciple. Things that are expected of disciples. Things that, that are the evidence of someone having a dis disciple of life. Okay? So just kind of read through there. Please make time to do this. Um, our discussion next week starts with that. So if you guys don't have any answers to that question, there's going to be a very short lesson next week. <laughs> so, um, okay. Uh, any questions on any of that? Everybody got that written down and all that? Okay. Uh, we will continue our discussion of deception next week. Um, and then the week after that, we'll be talking about discipline. And then the week after that, I believe. Let me go turn back. Just thinking. Uh, there. Um, and then after we're done with discipline, we'll look at temptation and addiction. Um, I know it's you're going to talk about addiction when you're talking about discipleship. Yes, and trust me, it definitely does fit. Um, so, if we have no questions, that's the end of the lesson. Or any comments? I have a comment. Go ahead. Well, we were just talking about, you know, what if God calls us to go somewhere that we don't want to go or do something that we don't want to do. And then you had talked about living intentionally, you know, and it just made me think about the verse that says, I I desire obedience over sacrifice. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think that we can't be foolish to think that obedience is often going to come with sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And we have to get it in our mind, in our minds, you know. And we have to pray for God to help us to be willing to sacrifice things to, in 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 order to be obedient. Mm -hmm. And that it's you know help us to live intentional lives, you know, to say, God, no matter where you, no matter where you take me, I just want to do yeah. your will. Yeah. And whether in you know that does mean self-sacrifice yeah. sometimes. You know, so we can't be foolish to think that, okay, well, the Bible says that he desires obedience over sacrifice, but sometimes being obedient is going to require sacrifice. Yeah. And I, I, I want to kind of build on what she just said. You know, living with intention as a Christian doesn't mean you know exactly where you're going to be next. doesn't mean you have your whole life planned out. It means you live an intentional life even though you don't know what's going to happen on tomorrow. See what I mean? Your intentional life is God-focused. That's how you live a life that's that's intentional. See what I mean? The things you do are, aren't a mistake, even though you're going to make mistakes. See what I mean? Even though you're going to move to places that you didn't expect and do things you didn't expect, you're still, like she was just talking about, that living with intention, living with focus, um, and that sacrifice that comes with it. A really great discussion, everyone. Great discussion, everybody. You, you, earned a, you ain't earned an A tonight. <laughs> Any other comments or questions?